It seems that home ownership is at an all-time high today. The economy is doing fairly well, and everybody wants part of the American dream. If you live in an apartment, you want to own a house. If you live in a house now, you want to own a bigger house. That's all part of the American dream. And it also seems like thousands of people, thousands of people, are moving out of the People's Republic of California into four states, Nevada, South Dakota, Texas, and Idaho. Why? Because houses are pretty much affordable in those states right now. And so everybody wants a piece of the American dream. They want a place where they can call home sweet home. And that's true for our text today. King Solomon is building a royal palace and a complex. A complex is obviously a compound or a, a large piece of land, but in that complex is the royal palace for the king. And so I understand that several preachers would look at today's text, chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, and they would say something much different than what I'm about to say from today's uh, text and from this pulpit. But I want to make things very clear. You know, some people have asked me uh, absolutely recently, you know, Rolla, what is your hermeneutic? Well, my hermeneutic, uh, if you don't understand that word, is how do you come to the exact meaning of an author? Well, it doesn't matter what the audience says because the audience could mess up the meaning or the original intent. It's not the message itself that gives the, the meaning. It's the author. The author's intent. What is the authorial intent of the author? That's how we are to look at the Bible. But on top of that, I have a Christ-centered hermeneutic. In other words, I don't look at the Bible and say, how are all of these things fitting together with the ethnic national Israel? That's not how I look at the Bible. I look at the Bible and I say, how are all of these things fulfilled in Christ? First and foremost, why? Because all of the scriptures point to Jesus. That's what Jesus says about himself. And so that's how I look at the Bible. That's how I preach. That's how, that's how I teach. What's the authorial intent of the author? And then how is this fulfilled in Christ? Because Christ is the key character in the New Testament. We are a New Testament church. That's how we're to look at the Bible. So there are many people who would preach against what I'm about to say today. And I want to make this very clear. This text is not about having the biggest home. It's not about having the best home. It's not about having the most expensive home. It's not about having a higher standard of living or adding gold, 24 karat electroplated gold on all your walls. That's not what this text is about. I know that there's TV preachers out there who will say, well, I believe, quote, I believe God wants to give us nice things. I'm talking about this text. Why? Who would, want to go, who would want to get in on something where you're miserable and poor and broke and ugly, and you just have to muddle through life until you get to heaven? This came from a pretty popular book in 2006 entitled, Does God Want You to Be Rich? And so, as Bible-believing Christians, I hope we would all agree that we would all say, no thank you, Joyce Myers. We're not interested in the health, wealth, and prosperity movement. We are not interested in having gold, electroplated gold walls and dust coming out of the vents. We're not interested in that. We're interested in what does the unadulterated Word of God say. God's people, you should say amen to that. We are people of the book. We're not people of the world. And so when these TV preachers talk about themselves, what they have is a self-centered hermeneutic. They want to know, how are all these things in the Bible fulfilled in me? Because it's all about me. Maximum impact, my best life now. If you feel good, you do good. Right? That's Eastern mysticism to its best. We need to be very careful how we look at this. What is the author's intent, and how is this fulfilled in Christ? That's what Bible believers do. We are about the book, about the Word of God. So I want to remind us of the background. Solomon is intent on building a 
temple for the Lord, and he finishes this temple. And this temple has three main parts, a portico, which is an entrance, a main hall, which is called a nav, or the holy place. But then the third part of this temple is the inner sanctum. It's the holy of holies. It's the most holy place. This is where God's holy presence from heaven resides or abides with his people in this most holy place. And there's a temple that separates the holy place, or there's a curtain that separates the holy place from the most holy place. The high priest is the only priest that could enter the most holy place once a year on the Day of Atonement, known as Yom Kippur. No priest, random priest, can just walk into the inner sanctum unscathed. You're going to pull out his body with a rope, dead body. And so only the high priest, once a year, not on any day, can go into the inner sanctum. There's restricted access there. And this great temple is made by some of the best materials that the world could offer in ancient Near Eastern cultures. Cypress, cedar, olive wood. And then we saw last week intricate carvings within this wood of gourds and open flowers and cherubim, which is angelic buildings or beings. But also in this temple, if you noticed last week, we have how much gold? Lots of gold. Gold, gold, and more gold. And the main point that I want to get across today in these 12 verses of chapter 7 is this. Preoccupation leads to lavishness. Preoccupation leads to lavishness. So let's talk about that in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished his entire house. So some would say Solomon has the right priorities. Right, Pastor Rolo? Because he built the temple dedicated to Yahweh, to God first, that's built, and now he's on to the second major project, which is the royal complex and his own palace. Well, we understand, according to 1 Kings 5, verse 5, that King Solomon talks to King Hiram of Tyre, which is the Phoenician region, next to the Mediterranean, and he says to him, my goal, my intent is to build a house for the Lord. I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord, my God. So the temple is complete, right? That's what a lot of people would argue. But I think that the author, the original author in these 12 verses is trying to put an emphasis here where us as Westerners, American Christians, simply gloss over and look over and don't really pay attention to what's happening in these 12 verses. There is a problem here. There is an emphasis here. So look with me to verse 38, chapter 6, verse 38. And it says this, we're talking about 1 Kings, by the way. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 38. And in the 11th year, in the month of Bull, which is the 8th month, the house was finished in all its parts and according to all its specifications. He was seven years in building it. So the temple was built in seven years. Sounds like no big deal. But when you look at chapter 7, the very next verse, verse 1, Solomon was building his own house, how many years? 13 years, and he finished his entire house. So the original author is trying to give the original audience that there is a contrast. One house was built in seven years, dedicated to the Lord, and the other house, dedicated to King Solomon, was 13 years. And so there's an emphasis here, nearly double the time. If you remember, chapter 5 is about preparing to build the temple. Chapter 6 is the temple is being built. And chapter 7 should be a continuation of chapter 6 that the temple is still being built or in the final stages. But then the author puts an emphasis here in the first 12 verses of chapter 7. And he takes us, the audience, into a different direction. There's a detour here. Yes, the temple is technically built. The four walls, if I could say it that way, are built. But it's only a shell. There are things that are missing in this temple, like holy furniture, right? Like the Ark of the Covenant. Because the Ark of the Covenant is a very important part of 
this temple worship to the Lord. Because the Ark of the Covenant represents God's presence with his people. And if you have no Ark in the temple, then you have no worship of God in the temple. What is the purpose of the temple? The purpose of the temple is that God would reside with his people as he promised. And God's people are supposed to worship God. But if you don't have any Ark of the Temple, then you don't have God. And so we have a very serious problem here that most of the time we don't see. So what's supposed to happen is that when you look at chapter 638, it should automatically flow to verse 13 of chapter 7. But then again, we've got this detour in the first 12 verses. We have here two houses. That's what this story or this narrative, historical narrative, is about. We've got two houses, one dedicated to God. It's technically finished, but it's missing key components. But then we have King Solomon's house, and it's fully furnished. It's ready to go. It's bigger, better, more expensive. King Solomon, I would argue, is engrossed about his home sweet home. It's about him. Now, some scholars would debate this sermon, but I believe that's where the author is going. Solomon's house is built, but God's house is just a shell. Is it sinful for a king to have a big home? No. Is it uh, sinful for a king to live in an expensive home? No. He's a king. By office, he should live in a nice, big, expensive home. But that's not the point here. Is it a sin to build a house and use it for God's glory? No. Is it sinful to have nice things in the home? No. And this applies to us here as well. We are Americans. We are Christians who live in America. We have more than brothers and sisters in third world countries will ever have in their entire lifetime. You know, we were at Fry Ranch, what, seven to ten days ago, and we had a wonderful group. I hope more of us can join the church family next year. But for the two or three days that we were there, church family, those of you who are with us, and we brought our little tent, and we brought our little cooler, and our little lawn chair, and some food, just for two days' provision, do we understand that that little bit of material items and supplies for two days is more than what other people have around the world just for those two days that we were gone. So personal homes are not sinful to own or to build or to have or to have nice things in. It's not sinful to have that. I believe that we can redeem everything, including our homes. We can use our homes to have and host Bible studies, prayer meetings, meals, inviting people to our homes. Part of being a Christian is hospitality, by the way. That doesn't apply just simply to pastors. That applies to every Christian. If you're a Christian, you should be inviting people into your home. That's just basic one-on-one -on -one Christianity. And so if you haven't been to the Bernal's household, we will have you over. Just be patient. There's just lots of you, right? We will have you over eventually. But the real question that is at stake here is what is our ultimate motivation for having a home? What is our ultimate focus for building a home? What is our ultimate motivation for buying a greater home or a more expensive home? I would argue it's not about money. It's really not about money or not having money. It's really not about having a house or not having a house. I know multimillionaires today who own 20,000 square foot homes and that 20,000 square foot homes is not enough. They're looking for a bigger home and a better home. Yes, rich people can be greedy, so can poor people. You know, we live in some sort of weird mindset that only rich people can be greedy. I know poor people who, they look very poor. You know, they stink like the rest of us, right? But they have more money in the bank than we even realize. I just found out recently that a person that we were helping uh, with financial needs and medical needs, he has six figures in the bank. And I thought this man was financially poor. But 
Even poor people can be greedy and stingy. So what's the point, Pastor Rolla? The point is, it's a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of the house. It's not a matter of the dollar. It's a matter of the heart. What's the motivation of your heart? And as Christians, if we're not careful, many times we will be like King Solomon. We're just engrossed. We're preoccupied with our own home that God has blessed us with. And we invite no one into our homes. We think, well, this is my house. God gave me this house. I'm a Christian. I sing Kumbaya just like every other Christian. I don't need to invite other people into our home. I would say no. Better yet, have we forgotten our great God? Because the reason we act like that and think like that is we forget our purpose in this life as Christians. And the reason we forget that purpose is we've forgotten the great God who saved us. We forget what he's done for us. Let me remind us of Psalm 73, verse 25. It says this, Whom have I heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from me shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But listen to this, dear saint. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. The psalmist Asaph, he declares that God is good, that God will judge sin, that God is his strength and his portion forever. And yet this psalmist is actually jealous as well because he looks to the wicked and he says the wicked prosper in this life. Let me put this in Rolo paraphrastic terms. That sinner over there doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't know God from a goat, but he prospers. He's got a nice retirement. He's got a nice home. He's got a nice car. He's got a beautiful wife and beautiful kids. He prospers. He prospers, and he's wicked, and he hates God. And he asks the question, whom do I have in heaven but you? And what does the psalmist say? There is no other God that I desire but only the true living God, Yahweh himself. I just want God. I want the true living God. I'm thirsty for God. I just want God. In verse 26, my flesh and my heart may fail. But listen to this. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He just wants God. He doesn't care about materialism. It's not that we can't redeem materialism. It's not that we can use these great gifts and blessings that God has given us for the glory of his name. But for this psalmist, who is Asaph, he wants God. He doesn't want anything else. Are we like this psalmist, Asaph? Or does our heart just wander and wander and wander? If I could just have more things in this life, then I'll just be perfectly happy. You know, we would never say... We would never say that God doesn't exist. As Christians, people of the book, we would always say, God does exist. God is real. God cares for me. Psalm 14.1 says this, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And we would say to those who don't know Christ, those who are non-Christians, they are fools. In other words, those fools are atheists. That's how we would stereotypically categorize them. There's no, there is no God. That's what the fool says. But don't we act like atheists when everything we do Monday through Saturday is all about what we want? We would never admit that. But functionally, we're acting like atheists when we say, this is my house, my stuff, my decision, my way, my time, my strength, my schedule. And we functionally act like God doesn't exist. And on Sunday, we profess that God does exist. But the other six days of the week, we don't. We are functional atheists. Why? Because we forget God. We forget how great God is. We forget the, the sin debt that was on us until Jesus came on the scene. 
We forget what we deserve in this life. And so if we're not careful, we're going to end up being preoccupied and engrossed just like Solomon in all his glory and all his splendor about his own home. I hope that we're more like Asaph. All I want is God. All I want is God. Which now leads to verse 2 through 12. Preoccupation leads to lavishness. Read with me in verse 2. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits, and its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. And it was built on four rows of cedar pillars, and with cedar beams on the pillars. And it was covered with cedar above the chambers that were on the 45 pillars, 15 in each row. There were window frames in three rows and window opposite window in three tiers. All the doorways and windows had square frames and window was opposite window in three tiers. And he made the hall of pillars. Its length was 50 cubits and its breadth 30 cubits. There was a porch in front with pillars and a canopy in front of them. And he made the hall of the throne where he was to pronounce judgment. Even the hall of judgment, it was finished with cedar from floor to rafters. His own house where he was to dwell in the other court back of the hall was of like workmanship. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter whom he had taken in marriage. All these were made of costly stones cut according to measure, sawed with saws back and front, even from the foundation to the coping and from the outside to the great court. And the foundation was of costly stones, huge stones, stones of eight and ten cubits, and above were costly stones cut according to measurement and cedar. The great court had three courses of cut stone all around and a course of cedar beams, so it had the inner court of the house of the Lord and the vestibule of the house. So if you look at verses 2 through 5, there's this part of the royal complex called the house of the forest of Lebanon or the palace of the forest of Lebanon. In your bulletin, I provided another visual aid. I'm a visual person, and so when the Bible talks about maps or architecture, it helps me to assimilate and learn more of the information visually. So I provided one in your bulletin. And so you'll see the King, uh, King Solomon's royal complex and all the parts that are within that complex. And there are five key areas within this complex. This one area is the house of the forest, which we just read. And this is 150 feet long by 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. So if you can imagine that, that's a pretty large piece of square footage. Jewish tradition says this is much larger than these measurements. And as Americans, if we were to compare backyards, so to speak, we like to build gardens, small to medium-sized gardens. But King Solomon takes it 10 levels up, and instead of building a small to medium garden, he builds a garden of forest trees, of cedars. This is a literal forest in his complex, and the purpose of this area is served as a state treasury. This is a place where you would display all precious objects and items in this area. And so this forest is larger than the temple. If you were to compare the square footage from last week to this week, the forest is larger than the temple. And if you look at the dimensions of this, it has four rows of cedars with cedar beams on the posts, there's 15 cedar posts, three in a row. So if you go 15, 30, 45, there's 45 post pillars. The window frames are artistic or beveled. And the doorways are squared as opposed to arched. So that is the forest of Lebanon. Then we look at verse 6, the pillars or the hall of pillars. This is a colonnade or a columned hall. This is another key area within the royal complex. The dimensions are 75 feet long by 52 and a half feet wide. It has a portico or an entrance and it has a canopy in front of this entrance. And what is the purpose of this hall of pillars? Well, some believe that this is just a fancy entrance that leads into the forest of Lebanon, this garden forest. It's a 
fancy waiting area. But then we get to verse 7, another key part of the royal complex known as the Hall of Throne or the Judgment Hall. This is where King Solomon would go to render a legal decision. This area is finished with cedar from floor all the way to the rafters or all the way to the ceiling. As you can tell or should know by now, King Solomon spares no expense. He has the best of the best, not only in the temple, but also in the royal complex. And so the king would act as the supreme court justice all in one person. Why? Because he's the king. This is the place where he would dispense justice and make a legal ruling and make judicial decisions. For all intents and purposes, this building is the highest building for legal decisions. If you look at Psalm 72, verse 1, it says this, Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. So King Solomon writes this royal psalm. And what is he asking God? He's asking God to bless the king with justice that he would be a just king. And in one sense, Solomon is the royal son. Why? Because he's the king. God is the one who put King Solomon into that royal office. And as such, he is a royal son in one sense, because God appointed him king over Israel. But symbolically speaking, if you look at the design of the temple and you look at the design of the royal complex, they butt up against each other. The temple is just south of this royal complex. Now, if you think about this, the temple has this inner sanctum. This is where we see the holiness of God, that God cannot abide with those who are sinful. They will die on the spot. That's why there's this massive curtain known as the veil between the most holy place and the holy place. It's to protect the people from God's holiness. Otherwise, they will die. So to enter, symbolically, this holy place, you've got this hall of thrones or this judgment hall. In other words, to come into the presence of the holy God, there has to be judgment. And only the faithful high priest can do that for God's people once a year. So there's symbolism there. But the question we have to ask is, who is the true royal son who judges the people with righteousness? It can't be Solomon, because I have shown us, hopefully, over the last several sermons, that King Solomon is not the perfect king. He's not the perfect judge. There's red flags all over the place. And the perfect royal son is King Jesus, and only King Jesus. He is the one in verse 11 of Psalm 72 where it says, May all kings fall down before him and all nations serve him. Well, how can that apply to King Solomon ultimately? Because he will die. But Jesus is the king who dies and is resurrected and who will never die again. He is the true king where all kings of the entire world will fall down before him and serve him. And in the immediate context of Psalm 72, written by King Solomon himself, the source of justice is God Almighty himself. He is the true source of justice. And at the same time, God will judge the world through the royal son, Jesus, with perfect justice. I'm going to call an audience. All right. Can you hear me? All right. A wise man once said that the devil works through electronics, and this happens to be one of those examples. So Jesus is the royal son that King Solomon cannot compare to. 
Proverbs 17, written by Solomon, says this, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. To the perfect God, the Holy One, the Sovereign One, the Lord is disgusted and revulsed when the guilty are acquitted. Why? Because he's holy. Those who break God's law deserve judgment. They deserve condemnation. They deserve hell. That's what a holy, good God does. He judges sinners for their sins. So when those who break the law are now acquitted for no reason, no good reason at all, it's detestable or detestful to God. But also, those who are righteous, those who are righteous who are not violators of God's law, they are judged as wicked for not breaking God's law is also an abomination to God. And so the Lord is detested when the violator goes free and those who are free or righteous, so to speak, are condemned guilty. But in Christ, both of those are fulfilled because Christ is the one who, have, who has never broken the law of God. He is the one that goes to the cross and experiences a gory, bloody death on behalf of sinners. And because the sin of the sinner is put upon Christ and Christ dies, all of that verse is now fulfilled. Jesus, the innocent one who is condemned, dies on the cross, which is reserved for criminals who break the law, so that we who break the law are now free. We are liberated from the yoke and slavery of sin. We are acquitted of our cosmic crimes against the Holy One of God. It's only in Jesus can that happen. So Jesus is cursed so that we would be blessed. Who else on planet Earth can do what Jesus Christ has done? Answer, no one. That's what makes Jesus unique. Our salvation is all of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, what the law required of us, Jesus fulfilled, or better yet, Jesus earned and merited our salvation by not breaking the law of God at all. And we receive that blessing as Christians, as saints of God, by faith in the one who perfectly satisfied the law of God that we can never do on our best religious day. That's how those who are condemned are now acquitted. We are acquitted because of Jesus Christ, by faith in him and him alone. So for all of us to think that every one of us in here are Christians who are born again is foolish. I'm grateful to the Lord, non-Christian, that you're here. But it would be better for you to settle your crime against the holy judge of the universe right here, right now, before the last day of judgment. Because once appointed to die, then the judgment. There is no reincarnation. There is no purgatory. There is no second chances. There's none of that. It's better for you to settle your legal case before the holy judge of the universe by turning away from your sin, your cosmic crimes, and trusting in Jesus, the Holy One. But for us, God's holy wrath is poured out upon us. Or God's holy wrath is poured upon Jesus on the cross. And we repented of our sins, did we not? We trust in Jesus Christ for salvation alone, did we not? And those who do that are forgiven of all of their sins. And we praise God for that. Jesus is the greater judge. Jesus is the greater king, not Solomon. And when we compare both houses, the temple and the complex, King Solomon is copying parts of the temple into his own complex. And it's easy to gloss over that. And what Solomon is doing is he's focused on building a temple called the complex 
that mimics the temple, and yet it's designed to worship him. Because why? It costs lots of time. It costs lots of labors. It costs lots of servants. It costs lots of money. King Solomon is focused on the best of the best for himself. It's costly. The costly of everything. The most expensive stones were cut and sawed. 12 to 15 foot long pieces of expensive stone were sized and shaped and laid down in the foundation. And so what is King Solomon doing? He's rivaling the temple. He's rivaling temple worship. Why? Because the temple is built, but there's no ark. There's no presence of God. There is no worship of God. But yet, King Solomon's house is ready to go. It's ready to go, and no expense was spared. Which leads to verse 8, Solomon's house. It's very similar to the temple. But if you noticed in the text, there's a house for Solomon, and there's a house for his wife, Pharaoh's daughter. It seems that there's a private courtyard that separates the, queen's, the king's quarters from the queen's quarters. And in an ancient Near Eastern cultures, it was typical for a queen to have her own private home away from the king. The royal palace is designed, as one reformer would say, for the king and queen and for pleasure, public feasts, games, pastimes, walks, gardens, and groves. It was designed for many things, but if you noticed, there was nothing here that points them to the Lord. One of the red flags that we saw earlier in the book of 1 Kings is that King Solomon married a foreigner. He married the daughter, daughter of Pharaoh. What does Egypt have to do with Jerusalem? Egyptian people don't worship the same God as Israelites. It's not a matter of, as, it's not a matter of ethnicity or race. It's a matter of who do you worship? Do you worship the true living God? Or do you worship idols? That's the problem. And some believe that King Solomon married this woman for political peace. He never asked God for advice. He never asked God for help. He never asked God to lead. He just married this woman to have political peace within the region. And marrying one idol worshiper is enough. But by the time we get to chapter 11, the text says that King Solomon married many foreign wives, many idol worshipers. And all of these women are going to draw the king's heart away from the true and living God, from worshiping the true and living God. And this queen's quarters is going to be the headquarters of a royal harem once we get to chapter 11. So what's the problem, Pastor Olo? You've talked a lot. You've said a lot. And you mean a lot. What's the problem? The problem is there's a preoccupation by Solomon with selfish desires, which leads to lavishness. Solomon is not focused on finishing the temple. He's focused on his own complex, his own house. So where do we go from here? Well, as God's people, we need to focus on God's house and God's kingdom and God's worship for God's glory. Matthew 6.33 says this, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus is teaching and preaching uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew 6, Jesus is telling his disciples, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious for tomorrow. Don't be anxious about your life, food, drink, clothing, or your body. Don't be worried about that. And then in verse 28 of that chapter, Jesus brings in a new topic. A lily. A lily of the field. He talks about how they grow and how they operate. What is King Jesus doing? He's comparing King Solomon 
to this lily of the field. In other words, the lily is undistracted by the ways of this world. And this little beautiful lily brings more glory to God because this lily is not focused with the things of this world than King Solomon and all of his glory and splendor and money and gold because he was very distracted. That's the point of Matthew 6. This little lily is more beautiful and glorious than all the riches of King Solomon. John chapter 4, verse 23. It says this, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So where do we go from here, God's people? We need to invite others to worship the true and living God. We understand that the world is spiritually dead. They're dead in their sins spiritually. They're darkened in their understanding. But yet we are called to share the gospel with them. We're called to invite them to worship the true king in the true house. And in this text, Jesus speaks to a Samaritan woman. And Jesus calls her out for her adultery. And then the subject of worship comes up. And she says to Jesus, our fathers worship on this mountain. This mountain is Mount Gerizim in Samaria. Samaritans have nothing to do with Jews, and Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. Why Jews look at Samaritans as half-breeds ethnically, half-Jew, half-Samaritan. But Jesus says in regards to worship on Mount Gerizim in Samaria, Jesus says the hour is coming where location doesn't matter. Location doesn't matter. It's not Mount Gerizim in Samaria. It's not Jerusalem in Israel. It's not about location. It's not about race. It's not about ethnicity. It's not about gender. It's about the work of God in the Holy Spirit within God's people. And where the Spirit of God is and where God's people come together as a church, there is true worship of God when God's people come together called the church. That's where that text is heading. It's not about a physical building in the Old Testament. It's not about brick and mortar. God is bringing Jew and Gentile together in Christ to worship the true and living God in Christ. And in John 14, verse 2, it says this, In my Father's house, this is Jesus speaking, In my Father's house, are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's a few hours away from being betrayed by one who was close to him over a three-year period of time, Judas, for 30 shekels of silver. He's a few hours away from Peter denying him three times in public. He's a few hours away from experiencing the agony, the pain, the suffering of the cross for the sins of his people. And yet Jesus comforts his disciple in the midst of this situation. Jesus is not talking about a literal house in heaven. The literal house points to heaven. That's the point of the text, where God's primary residence is located. Jesus goes to prepare a place for his people, those who repent of their sins and trust in Jesus. Jesus goes to prepare a place for his people, for those who trust in him, in heaven. So it's not about Solomon's house. It's about God's house in heaven. It's all about God. It's all about God's glory. There's an Anglican lay theologian by the name of Vinoth Ramachandra who wrote a book several years ago entitled Gods That Fail. And this is what he says about Americans. This is what he says about American Christians. This is what he says about Westerners. This is a man who lives currently in Sri Lanka. And we looks, when he looks at American Christianity, this is what he says. The people of the modern West and the middle class of non-Western cultures 
are better fed, better housed, better equipped with health care than those in any previous age in human history. But paradoxically, they also seem to be the most fearful, the most divided, the most superstitious, and the most bored generation in human history. All the labor-saving devices of modern technology have only enhanced human stress, and modern life is characterized by restless movement from place to place as nomads, from one experience to another, in a frenetic world of purpose, purposeless activity. This is how he describes American Christians and Americans as a whole. He's saying that people in the West, we are distracted people. We are not a focused people. And the easiest thing that distracts us is materialism. Now, if you remember what I said earlier in my sermon, I believe you can redeem your house and your finances and every blessing that God has given you for the glory of his name. But isn't there an element of truth to what this person says about us? Are you living for the glory of God? Be honest before God. Be honest with yourself. Are you living for the glory of God? This is how you'll find out. Are you content with where you're living, whether you own a house or don't? Whether you live in an apartment? Are you content where you're living right now? And is that desire submitted to the authority of God? Or are you desiring bigger things, better things, more expensive things, if that's the case, then your desire is not submitted to King Jesus. If we're not careful, brothers and sisters in Christ, we will be just like King Solomon, preoccupied, which leads to lavishness. Sermon in a sentence. Our great God invites others into his home, heaven, through faith in Jesus alone, which is more important than building our own homes. Let us focus on the glory of God. Let us focus on why God has saved you. Let us focus why we work so hard. Let us focus on our businesses and why we have a business. Let us focus on why we're a mother. Let us focus on why we're a father. God saved us for his glory. And we can redeem the things in this world for his glory, but if we're not careful, we'll be just like King Solomon. Preoccupied, which leads to lavishness. I pray that we would not.